Well, and that's time for another tight five live with Ben Kimber and Morgan Turanui. Morgs, the best thing about this is you and I have been doing podcasts now for a number of months and we haven't had any Aussie rugby to talk about. So straight up top of the show, before I get into what we're going to do, rugby is back, my friend. That must make you happy. Oh, it certainly does. We're not talking about board machinations or politics. We're not even talking about rugby happening across the ditch. We're talking about rugby in Australia, Super Rugby AU. Rugby is officially back. Got to see some local derbies on the weekend. It was great to see the youth of Australian rugby out in the field again. Mate, that's exactly right. I sat down Friday and Saturday night both, quiet beer, watched the Australian games, watched the New Zealand games. Plenty to talk about. Let's talk about now the way that we want to run this show. When you and I do a podcast, you and I can talk far too long. We dig in. You particularly, as we've said before, uh, can really stretch it out. So what we want to do is cut a nice tight show and we want to pull out the things from the weekend that are worth talking about. We're going to look at both Australia and New Zealand. We've got some clips from a chat we recorded earlier with Daniel Halangahu, former Waratahs teammate of yours, uh, now currently the Blues assistant coach. But today, uh, it's really about six big things. It's called Type 5, but for us, that now means try to keep everything under five minutes. Uh, today, we're going to talk bringing back, back the stink. Stupid scrum penalties. There's a lot of talk around the first two Australian games and the way the scrum penalties played out in those. Uh, Morgs, we're going to get your player of the round. I'm going to have a couple of suggestions, but you're going to pick that. You're going to give us your player of the round. We're going to talk about Jack Maddox at the back. And are the force going to get flogged? Of course, Australian rugby isn't complete until next week when the force get their first game. So we'll get into that as well. But to get us going, this is the intent now. We want to try to make sure that we keep the show tight, that we keep it moving for you. Don't forget you can comment as we go. We'll try and get your comments involved with the game as well. But to talk about Bring Back the Stink, first up, let's get in here. And this is it, Morgs. This is a new edition. We're going to try and time ourselves, all right? We're going to try and keep it tight. Now, I wanted to talk about Bring Back the Stink because Lockie Swinton really summed that up for me this weekend. The Australian public has been torn apart by the state of Australian rugby. Everything's in a state of flux. We don't know what's going on. We need to see the players care. We need to know they want to be in it. We know that the New South Wales Blues had Paul Gallen get involved with him beforehand, try to get a rugby league state of origin vibe for them. I think that worked for Lockie Swinton because the players that I saw on the weekend getting in each other's faces, feeling that antagonistic, you know, uh, bent towards the opposition, such as Swinton. So we saw a bit from Tani Latupo, even though he probably got harshly carded. We really saw a lot of that good angst and I think it's really important. We need it, Morgs. Yeah, we do. We need a controlled discipline. Let's not say it's got to be stupid, try and be old school, back off the valley, you know, people baying for blood on the Ballymore Hill. But I like the fact that it started 24 hours earlier with the press conferences. The players are really engaging, not boring, cliched quotes, a bit of chat about the New South Wales, Queensland rivalries. No banjo chat, but not far off that, you know, a dislike between the teams. You know, the traditional rivalry. Then they backed it up on the park. It was a willing game of physical, and Swinton, as always, will be the aggressor. I don't think we need to, to drag in state of origin players. I think Queensland and New South Wales rugby union players have got enough passion for it. But And Swinton's always going to bring that. I think he brings that to the table, and he did it well again on Friday night. Mate, he absolutely did. And I even saw Will Harris, the new New South Wales number eight, in the background of that Jack Maddox trial where they carved through the middle pushing the head of Fraser McGrath, so really getting in their ear, and you could see the stink was on. We need it to come back hard and fast this game. I think the, the broadcast ratings were about what they have been previously. People need to know it's back on. We need those stories coming out of it. And Lockie Swinton, for me, I think I saw about four different times in the game where he was at, in their plays. It didn't seem contrived. He seemed like he really wanted to go hard at them. He wanted to get in their face. He wanted to know they were there, and a couple of big hits means that he's one of the guys I'll talk about when we get down to our player of the round. Well, it's a combat sport, Benny. We need him. Absolutely. Look at that, mate. First segment done. Into the next one. Now, um, stupid scrum penalties. I've called it this, Morgs, because uh, we saw what I thought was something a bit ridiculous. But first of all, the scrum for the Australian games was really very much a feature. Let's give this one, um, let's give this one three minutes because I think there's a little bit to talk about. But uh, in the, in the Brumbies-Rebels game, uh, we saw a, a really strange turn up for the books with about six or seven scrum penalties going to the Rebels against the Brumbies. Brumbies, you'd consider up the stronger scrum. In the uh, Reds-Waratahs game, we saw Angus Bell yellow carded after lots of pressure from Taniella Tupo. Morgs, what was going on? We even saw Rob Penny, I think, complain that the refs didn't know what was going on at the scrum. 
Yeah, well, I think along the lines of rugby is back, I think we can give everyone a bit of a pass in the first week, referees included. So I'm interested in who you're calling stupid here. This is your segment. You came up with the headline for this one. <laughs> who are you calling stupid? I'll we get to that. At the end. Yeah. So, look, the referees are going to be rusty just as much as the players were as well. So we'll probably give them a free pass. And the great thing about Super Rugby AU is it's all Australian centralised. So the coaches and the referees can be talking week in, week out. They can be exchanging video feedback about what they're looking for, what the coaches are thinking. So I expect the officiating to improve as the weeks go on, just as the rugby will be, and hopefully have a really streamlined officiating where the rugby speaks for itself. In saying that, Brumby Scrum... It's probably still the dominant scrum in, in Australian rugby along with the Reds. I think what happened really, if you look at it chronologically in the game, two scrum penalties for engaging early, uh, which is you know a couple of cheapies. Then they started to go down off their feet, how greasy the deck is and things like that go into it. And then at the back end, I, think, I thought the Brumbies probably gained in terms of dominance. We didn't see penalties in that game where one packs on their on roller skates going backwards. We saw technical Penalty. So that that's a, that's a flawed opinion going, oh, you know, the Brumbies scrum's been deep out and not as good. The Rebels did well. Rebels are smart, got that going. Obviously, it was the case with the Reds. Taniela Tupo, which was great, he took young Angus Bell to school. Angus Bell's going to be a great prop, but he had his head shoved through his backside. He's got some work to do with Mark Belly's old man at scrum training this week. And the only thing you want to talk about there is, is it yellow card? Is it penalty try? Is it both? Well, mate, that's exactly why I called it stupid to me. It, it is a stupid rule. Is there any, any other sport in the world where you can get a yellow card and sent off the field for not being good enough at something? And it's even not quite not being good enough because it's an eight-man shove, right? There's a lot of blokes involved in that. So getting sent and sat down because you aren't quite up to the, the mark or your scrum isn't up the mark is silly. Give them a penalty try if it's within 10 metres or otherwise give them another penalty and work their way forward down the field. I think it's madness to send him off. He looked embarrassed going off. And, the, and I think the tough, the really tough thing on that is what people forget is everyone focuses on the props, right? They look at Belly and they go, yeah, he's a young prop. Have a look at what's behind him too. Ned Hannigan is a makeshift second rower. He's not your big tight head lock, the kind of guy that's going to really hold up your scrum. Back in the day, back in your day when I was reporting, I'd, I'd talk to the, the guys, the props off the record, and they'd always say, mate, we need Dan Vickerman behind me. If you get Dan Vickerman behind you, then you had the most rock solid platform for your scrummaging. If you're getting a guy who's not going to be that tight head lock, and, and Ned Hannigan, you know, well, best regards to him, is not that guy, you're going to find it hard. So a young bloke up against the absolute power of Taniella Tupo with Ned Hannigan behind him, it was always going to be trouble. Agreed. Good point, though, about Ned Hannigan. Excellent. Bang on three minutes too, mate. We're flying. Now, uh, we're going to do player of the round now, and we're going to do play of the round. So what we want to do for these two, though, is every week we'll do this. We want to get the, the fans involved in it more in the future. We'll try and get some thoughts from them as well. But for right now, I want to see uh, from you, Morgs, we're going to talk player of the round, and then we're going to play a little clip about player of the round. But for first up, mate, I had a couple of players that I wanted to mention. Firstly, I mentioned uh, – hang on, I'll start the clock on this one. Firstly, I mentioned um, Lockie Swinton before. As I said, what he brought to the game, the physicality that was needed, I really thought that he he deserves a mention for player of the round. And the other one for me is Fraser McRae. Australia feels really, really strongly supported in terms of back rowers now. I feel like Rennie's going to have a lot of guys that he's looking at, a lot of these young guys coming through. So they're the two names I would throw up, Morgs. Who did you like and why for player of the round? Yeah, I looked at the back lines. I was really impressed by Matt Hanson. Am I supposed to have two or three? What, what am I allowed? Because I'm going to have three. I'm pretty Go sure you told me too. So I apologize for that. Mac Hanson, I was really impressed. Really, really impressed. Uh, and, you know, you talk about back rowers being a strength in Australian rugby. I think fullbacks are the back rowers of Australian rugby in terms of back lines, in terms of just the riches that we have there. Banks, Maddox, as we'll talk about, Haylett Petty's there, those sorts of guys. You think about Falau leaves, Beal leaves, and we've still got fullbacks everywhere. We've got no 13s and we, we just need some wingers to come through. So we've got another 15 to add. I thought he had some excellent touches. Breaks tackles in contact, which I love to see from an outside back. I saw the great Laurie Fisher talk about, uh, I think he broke nine tackles, something like that. I'm sure our stats men that are on Twitter and Facebook will let us know. I thought he was excellent. Jack Maddox, um, I think a lot of people have seen that. How many times have I said it, Benny? He plays fullback. He'll play 50, 60 tests for the Wallabies. He's a fullback. Get him off the wing. Stop talking about tens. And there's smart rugby guys saying he's a 10. He's not a 10. He's a fullback. He's going to be a great one for the Waratahs. Hey, you're, going, you're jumping ahead. That was your point for later in the show. You've got to jack his back, jack at the back no, segment. Well, well he did, that's how he gets in there because if he's nominated, but he doesn't win. <laughs> he doesn't win the body of work player of the round. I think we should call that maybe. But Body uh, of work. Noel Alessio for the Brumbies. Uh, I thought he was assured, excellent. And now he's got a little bit of pressure on him. There's a little bit of expectation. Yes, he's behind an excellent uh, pack 
uh, with the Brumbies. And as we mentioned, their lineup was good, but their scrum had issues. I thought he imposed himself on the game. And when the Brumbies were imposing themselves collectively on the game, he was right in the thick of it. They put their foot off the accelerator, which we might talk about at some stage, but they probably had that game covered at all times, and I thought he was excellent. And what I love about a, a good performance from a Teddy is looking at their nine, and you see Joe Powell had a great game, which facilitated Lodiceo having a good game as well. So a 10 plays well. The, the jerseys one to nine are doing their job, so that's a great sign for the Brumbies. He's probably in the front running to get that gold jersey at the moment. A little bit more body of work from him, Ben M will see him in that gold jersey. So he's my first ever player of the round on the top five. But I liked I liked your choice of Lolasia there. And one of the things I thought about him too was was how you, how pace means so much in the game. He gassed there in between Meeks and I think it was uh, Ross Hale at Petty uh, to set up right for that try. So that ability just to hit that mark and you know maybe not quite the fastest wallaby over for the first five meters like you you were called previously, mate. But um, but Three just that meters. little bit of pace. Only three metres, not five. It was only three metres, sorry, mate. But uh, that bit of pace, but also the willingness to have a go. I can see Lolacito is really looking heads up and having a go. The Brumbies, probably, you know, weren't weren't perhaps uh, as impressive as I thought they might be. Um, you know, they probably did take the foot off the gas there in that period uh, where the force came, uh, where, sorry, where the, where the Rebels came back into it. But, uh, uh, you know, from Lolacito, who's still a young player, really impressive, good to see. Mate, we, what we might do now is we're going to do the play of the round in a second. We're going to talk about uh, the, the the move that you've pulled out that you want to you want to dissect. But we might actually just go uh, to uh, a couple of our clips with Daniel Halangahu first. So uh, Hangers, it's you know it's well it's after ten o'clock in New Zealand now, and he's he's got the family to look after. So we recorded some uh, some chat with uh, with Daniel Halangahu earlier. For those who remember Daniel, of course, seventy four Waratahs caps. Uh, he he was a five eight in your time. Also, what sort of a player do you remember, Dan? Is? Yeah, excellent player. Just a really hard worker, really diligent, always made himself better. Was excellent at club level with Sydney Uni and had a good stint at the task. Could play 12 and 10 as well. Goal kicked excellently well. Good kicker in general. Played a bit of a complete player and then went and played a bit overseas. And now another great thing for Australian rugby is he's coaching. Unfortunately, it's in New Zealand. Fortunately, I suppose he's learning from some excellent players and some excellent coaches over there. Absolutely. And I think just Steve Lenthal looks like he's corrected me I think he says it was Meeks and Stolberg. I think I said it was Hale at Petty, but they won't like watching the replay of that try. Exactly right, Steve. So, guys, let's uh, let's just have a quick look at uh, the chat that we had earlier with Blues assistant coach and former Waratah Fave 8, uh, Daniel Halangahu. Well, all the way across the ditch from Auckland, we have Blues assistant coach Daniel Halangahu. Hangers, how are you, buddy? Yeah, good, fellas. Good to see some familiar faces. Mate, it's been a while, mate. Uh, you, you're bunkered down over there. How's it been for the pandemic with you? Oh, really good. You know, we're, I guess we're one of the more fortunate places in the world at the moment. So we, you know, we've come through it pretty well and um, back playing rugby and been training for a while and, and the team's together. And now, um, you know, to get some big crowds along, uh, you know, we're really fortunate. Well, mate, uh, we certainly have noticed the rugby, the only rugby in the world there for a little while. Australian rugby's back now, but you've had a couple of weeks uh, to get there ahead of us. The Auckland Blues, buddy, there's a lot of buzz around the team at the moment. Are you feeling that buzz? Is the team feeling the kind of energy in New Zealand? Yeah, so I, th I think it's, you know, for Auckland, they've been, you know, the city and the region's been, you know, waiting for this for a long time, you know, not just the through the pandemic, but actually for a number of years, so... Uh, to see us out there and competing strongly with the other New Zealand teams is, is, is exciting, not just for the team and the people here, but uh, a lot of the people around. It's such a rugby strong city. Um, you know, this is that's what I love about Auckland. It's you know, rugby is the big sport. It's the main sport, and the people here love it. So, um, look, there is a buzz. We, we're keeping our feet on the ground. Like you know, to get a few wins is good, but um, but just to see the people who have always sort of stood by us now to starting to enjoy watching us play and turning up. It's, um, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, Hangers, is, is that kind of expectation or that, that is something that you've had to handle as a team? I saw a quote from, from the boss today, Leon McDonald, saying, we've done nothing yet, uh, a couple of wins, uh, but it must be hard to avoid the amount of noise that does start to come around a team which has that footprint like Auckland with, with Blues, like which has that, has that history as well. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's that history is balanced with the recent history. So um, on one hand, there is, you know, there's a lot of people here who love the team and want us to do well. But the rest of New Zealand, you know, the Blues have sort of been laughed at for a long time. So it's pretty easy to keep your foot in, feet on the ground when we, you know, some of the some of the little milestones we're trying to 
clock up at the moment is is winning against the other New Zealand teams and winning away against them. And and in some cases, it's been 20, 30 games since we've achieved that. You know, like we, we knocked the Chiefs off down in Hamilton and it hadn't been done for 25 games. We've won, I think, you know, three of the last 30 games against them. So um, it's pretty easy not to get caught up in it because you can just be, you know, reminded, um, you know, the, the good Blues teams that have been, you know, there's been good coaches and, and good players in the recent history but haven't succeeded. So uh, we're not getting hit as ourselves. But, um, look, there's a good feeling amongst the team. They're, they're a good bunch of guys and, and the culture at the moment's one of working hard and wanting to not just enjoy our rugby but actually um, succeed and, and do well for this, this region. Mate, it's been great to watch you guys play, and particularly there's a few names that stand out. Talk us through some of the way that the, some of the ways that the team is coming together. That back row, so Tutu, uh, Papali'i look pretty good. Uh, you got a, you got a couple of handy, uh, experienced five eights in the team who aren't playing five eight. You got Dan Carter and Bowden Barrett, but you got Black there in at number ten. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting challenge when you've got you know probably the, one of the best ever players um, who's now around our group, and then. And of the most recent times, probably the best player in the world. Um, so having those two guys around and then being a former 10 myself, that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, trying to, you know, gee, we always... Gee, they're lucky, gee, they're lucky to have you there teaching <laughs> how to play 10. Well, what well, a great always, opportunity um, for these guys, you know? Yeah, you no, know, I've always tried to make players better, but um, <laughs> trying to get them to make those two better is a, a serious challenge. But look, I think, I think what was really crucial for us um, when we went into this season before the pandemic was that this team was successful without Bowden. You know, we wanted to win games without him. We didn't want any expectation on him just to come in and turn this team around. So the fact that, you know, before the break, we were in the top four and, and we'd won five on the trot, you know, without Bowden was was crucial for us. Um, it showed the great work that Tom Coventry's done with the, the forward pack. Um, we saw that on the weekend, you know, the, the forward pack got us out of trouble, really. Um, and outmauled the Highlanders, which not many teams do. So, you know, it's um, it's much more than just a couple of stars, but they certainly um, they certainly add a lot of balance to the team. Man, it's interesting uh, with the, with Bowden back in the team at fullback too, because there was probably a lot of talk or, or controversy perhaps around him not playing ten for the All Blacks last year. That you know, coming into the World Cup year, they were discussing whether whether Moanga or, or he would take it. He ended up not, and in hindsight, some would suggest that. Perhaps he might have been a, a better choice. You 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 were comfortable with him at fifteen? Yeah, and that's that's been so far. Um, look, and that's not set in stone by any means. We we've, we've moved him to ten during games, and we'll continue to do that um, at times. And then you know he's going to start some games at ten as well. Um, he's he's a really good guy. I've I've never seen um, you know a world class player like himself. And you know we've seen some in Australia, some of those really world class players, but. Um, I don't think I've ever seen someone as professional as him. He is just that hardworking and always trying to get better. Um, but then on the other side of it, he, he 100% doesn't even bat an eyelid when we say we'll put him at 15. He prefers to play 10. He's made that clear, but he said, mate, whatever's best for the team, that's what he wants to do. Um, so he's enjoying that. It's also been probably a bit of a soft start for him, um, trying to fit in you know, a new team, new organisation. And, and obviously we went out there against the Hurricanes in his – in his first game for us, which was, um, you know, a big game for him and, and just a bit of a softer start probably to fit in at 15. But uh, we will uh, see him more and more at 10 at different times. And and the combinations with Otere, Otere is, you know, he's probably the best goal kicker in the comp. Um, he's guiding us around the field really well. So, uh, look, we're fortunate. We've got another couple of young 10s behind that. Um, so it'll be a matter of trying to keep some of these players in the years to come. But you say that he's uh, one of the most professional, the most professional players you've seen, uh, Bowden. You, you know, you've 74 caps yourself for the Waratahs, you know, no mean feat. What what do you see differently about what Bowden does that says to you, oh, my God, that's a level of professionalism that I haven't seen in many players? Um, well, I mean, I probably should have excused the present company. Morgan was certainly one of the best professionals we saw. Uh, I tell you what, I looked after that's him. That's not what he goes then, mate. <laughs> no, what he goes then. Eddie, Eddie's, Eddie's lost his memory. Hang on, remember, I looked after him on tour. He's right? oh, he a confident, happy player. Yeah, you know those older players when they get sort of early 30s and they they start to relax a bit and they just guide the young guys? Well, when Ice first started, Morgan was 
what were you, probably 22, and you were that probably, early 30s about six, top player. Yeah, about six months older than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you were still <laughs> one of those senior players who was certainly very cruisy and, um, you know, you had your coach's hat on in a very early early time, Morgs. But, no, Bowden's – look, Bowden's mental preparation. Um, he does some things that, that I just haven't seen in other players. You know, he goes through all the things that potentially will – uh, be you know upset his preparation and, and any sort of negative thoughts that that might happen for him. He writes them down and then he puts them you know in a box where he says no, that's not going to help me. So and then he can remove all those mental parts of his game. He he went out of his at the moment. He's before he started with us. He went and found David Allred because he thought his kicking could do with some improvement. So went and got Johnny Wilkinson's kicking coach and privately uh, employed him. So now David does some work with Bowden and. Um, and look, you know, he's so he wants to be world class, not just in his running game and, and the way he, he guides the team around, but now he wants to be a world class goal kicker. He sort of sees that as his one of his sort of final frontiers. But look, he's just always trying to get better. Um, and you know, I, I look up to him, he's, he's such a good role model for some of our young guys. And uh, he's yeah, yeah, we're, we're blessed to have him. And then to have Desi, um, DC join us as well. Um, a lot of people just think it's a bit of a joke. You shouldn't, you know, it's almost unfair. They, they ended up asking the Prime Minister over here, was it unfair that we were <laughs> signing up all these guys? But um, yeah. And that's how small New Zealand is. She actually responded. <laughs> she, <laughs> she got into it. Um, but uh, it's, uh, so we are fortunate. Bowden's, yeah, he's been bloody good. He'll be missed next year. But as I said, we've got some, um, we've got some young guys in behind him that, that are ready to go as well. Geez, he was good uh, hangers there, Benny. He was uh, actually obviously, you know, really relaxed, but it was funny how humble he was about working with those guys. You can see that it's a really good coaching cohort there that, you know, you're just facilitating making guys better players. So uh, there's some good points made there by hangers. Sent D- oh, yeah, he's a hard taskmaster, hangers, because it looks like he sent DC back to club rugby to get better. I reckon he said, mate, off you go. Go and prove yourself in club rugby and then... We'll see if we can get you back. So uh, hopefully we'll see the great man in, in, in the blue shirt not too long. be interesting to see him play against the Crusaders. That would almost be sacrilegious. So that was good. So I don't want to make it and, and centric, but we obviously don't get this much insight on this side over in Australia about, about the goings on there. Is there, in terms of selection, some influence from New Zealand rugby about where he plays? Was that a solely awkward decision when you talk about being at 15 and 10? Uh, look, he's – yeah, look, you know, I think in the past, um, you know, Shag Hanson was – he'd like to have conversations around some things that that suited the All Blacks, um, but there's been a big shift in the way that Fozzie does things. So, um, look, Ian, Ian Foster's been really good. He talks to, talks with us, asks about our plans. You know, we had a plan to move – um, Rico into the midfield. Rico wanted to play 13. It's been, you know, a dream of his for a long time. We asked Fozzie and he said, look, he's, he sees him as a winger, um, but he's more than happy for us to do what's best for us and and wants Rico to do what's best for him in the long term as well. So, um, look, he said what he'll, he'll need to see in the midfield if he wants to succeed there and, and find the, you know, get an all-black spot in the midfield. But um, And then discussions around Bowden, uh, pretty similar. You know, Fozzie said, look, uh, he can play 10 and 15. It's either one is, is going to suit. And, and then I haven't made their mind up on where he'll, uh, he'll be turning out for the All Black Solar. Mate, we, we haven't got you for long, so we'll just throw ahead. A big game next week. You guys have had the bye. You've had the week to, to, to relax or not relax, but at least um, reset ahead of a massive game. All eyes will be on Blues versus Crusaders uh, next week. I saw some quotes today. I think they're starting to to pat your backs a little bit, maybe the Crusaders, maybe trying to get you comfortable. Richard Moanga said they're awesome. They're a complete team. They've got everything. The big boys up front and the razzle-dazzle outside. Uh, then they've got Bodie and Otere uh, to steer the ship. Um, uh, what's the focus like in your team uh, heading into the Crusaders? It, it, while you said, you guys, as, as Leon said, you haven't done anything yet uh, in terms of the full competition, it's a massive game, this one, isn't it? Oh, it's huge. It's huge for everyone. You know, as, as you've seen and, and you've spoken about, the excitement over here around the competition is massive. Uh, the Crusaders are doing what they do. They've gone out and, and won. 
and they've won with bonus points and um, they can put it, you know, pat us on the back, but they're actually number one on the board and they were number one on the board before the pandemic and they've won the last three titles. So um, it's interesting. It's almost like they're as intelligent as Morgan around trying to pump up the other team. Um, yeah, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for Razor to go, oh, we're going to be the underdogs or something this week. <laughs> yeah. Three, yeah. three time I champions mean, never lost. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was, it's about I think it's about thirty seven years since we've beaten them down there. So no, it's um I think it's you know, we've won one game down there in the last seven or eight years, you know. So it's um look, it's it's a really good, exciting challenge for us. Um, we're looking forward right. to it. The boys will be sorry, buddy. Sorry. I was um, gonna say they got yeah. plenty of weapons to keep an eye on there, mate. Um I think that they won forty twenty against the Highlanders. They they sat down, Bryn Hall, George Bridge, and Sever Reese came off the bench. Uh they'll be all guns blazing for you though. A few guys you're gonna have to keep an eye on in that back line. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. They um look it's it's almost an all black back line and um, you know, Braden Enor is a guy who you know, you might not have seen too much of him as an all black, but he's certainly being touted as um he's gonna play more and more there over the next couple of years, but yeah, they've got, they've got plenty. I don't think George Bridge, he'll struggle to get a, a run in that team, I think, at the moment. So you've got the All Black starting uh, left wing. I was probably not going to start next week because um, they've just got too many others going well. You saw how good Will Jordan's going. Um, David Harvilli, one of the former guys in the competition. So, look, we've got a, we've got some firepower as well. It'll be a bloody good game. You know, the way Caleb Clark's bounced back from uh, his stint in sevens, uh, he's, he'll be putting his hand up for further honours as well. But... Um, Look, our guys are fresh. You're right. They've got the depth where they've been able to rotate uh, some of their players. Something we probably have learned from in those first three games is that we need to rotate our squad. We need to give guys a go because um, just how physical and, and the, how intense these matches are. It's, the, the guys can't, you know, they can't pump out four in a row of these and, and just get through them. You know, you get injuries and, and guys just even hit flat bits. It's um, So we know we need to really step up for this game, but also... Um, over the next month, we're going to need all our squad. Morgan, well, anything to close with hangers before we go? No, just well, probably the big thing is I mean, we're all really proud of what you're doing there. It's great to see you involved in some you know, excellent high-performance environments, doing stuff at both NPC level and super level, learning off great players and helping great players, learning off great coaches and helping great coaches keep doing what you're doing. And we'll get you over to, to coach the good guys at some stage. You could be able to drop that contrived Kiwi accent you're, you're rolling out at the moment. We won't, get, we, won't, we, won't, we, won't, we won't even get you down to Ramek to help you out. But no, it'll be good to see you back over this side doing some coaching too, mate. So it's yeah, good. mate. Does, yeah, does coaching well. the good guys mean that I, I go and learn that that twang accent from down in Coogee, is that what you mean? Go and coach the good guys in green? Mate, you come over, have a coffee at Barzara, and we'll talk about it. How's that? <laughs> oh, mate, I look forward to it. No. Daniel Akahu, mate, we wish you all the very best for the rest of the season. Maybe we'll get you back a bit later on, mate, when they've got more some success, some more success under your belt. Thanks for coming on. Cheers, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Hangers. Thanks, guys. Well, there you go, Daniel Helen Gahu. Now, we were going to put that in two parts, and I left you hanging in the middle there more because I had a, few, had a few technical difficulties with my camera, so we played the whole thing. Uh, we've still got a couple of segments left to go, though, of course, on the show. Now, everybody, uh, please post your comments onto Facebook or to YouTube as we go, and if you've got questions about things that we're not covering, at the end of the show, we'll go for a few of those questions and we'll get into those uh, to make sure that you're getting some feedback. I've seen some people su suggesting some things in the comments already they might like covered, but please post down below below in your Facebook and your YouTube, and we will have a go at it. Now, Morgs, each week we're going to do the play of the round. You're going to pick uh, something in the game to run through. Um, I'm just bringing it up on the screen now. Uh, Morgs, uh, do you want me to start playing it now, mate? You ready to go? No, no, before we start, I want to talk about it, the silver medal. So the silver medal for people that love going and watching the game and analysing it, this is the pretty obvious one. The other one is the first try by the Brumbies that, um, that Muirhead scores off the, off the line out. Um, mm. Go back and have a look at it uh, because, you know, you can imagine the Rebels, that have been drilling into themselves, watch out for the rolling mall for two weeks leading to that game. And the Brumbies play this beautiful little shift play that opens up space on the edge of the mall. It's a false rolling mall. And just if you if you like watching players working off the ball, Benny, I'm talking about bodies in motion, especially when you've not got the ball in your hands, have a look at the line Joe Powell runs in deception down the blind side to open up the try for Muirhead. He doesn't go anywhere closer than 10 metres to the ball, and he is the genuine try assist of that play. The other one, the winner of play of the round, is obviously the Jack Maddox try. If you play it there, Benny, we'll go through it. The important thing about this is it's it's almost the triple 
the triple deception in that every you know every, every team's thinking right out here the Tars are going around the corner. The Tars are going around the corner. So if you freeze it at the first ruck, Benny, when this player gets tackled, everyone's thinking, okay, they've gone and hit the 10 channel. First thing you're worried about is they're going around the corner. Okay, let's get our fold right. Back rowers are automatically getting around. You know, obviously got their winger in there as well, the Reds, because they're just on the edge of their 22. So you've got O'Connor holding back on the blind side. What you're thinking immediately there, 10 channel, right, Otars forwards around the corner. The change-up play is the 11 play or the hit-back play, and that is often played with a little loop on the nine out the back to a, a winger and maybe a, a two who's held in the tram tracks after the throw and numbers down trying to outflank a team on that 11 pattern. This is the third level of deception. If we, if we play it there, you see the one that everyone's seen. So you see the, the great false line from the nine, the dummy loop play, and then the one back inside to Maddox. And the great thing, obviously the, the attractive bit is Maddox working hard off the ball to run that arc, really hidden behind the ruck and appearing. But if we go back, we'll just rewind it about 10 seconds, Benny, just to when they scan out of, of that looping play. And you just see where everyone is. So you yeah. We just play it through it. If we stop it there, you can see that the, 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 the pot of three forwards for the Waratahs have gone around the corner. We can see the motion. I think it's Ram and Abel on the right-hand side making it look like Bottom the, of your screen the, there. Yeah. Yeah, the, the 11 plays on. You see the winger for the Reds working hard from that ruck to cover. O'Connor's out of screen covering. And, and you know what's really important, really important? Is Harry Johnson Holmes there, the tight head prop for the Waratahs, who's cleaned past the ruck. He's even running a tiny little block just in case, just in case the first defender on the open side of the Reds sees Maddox or tries to work hard to just slide in. Because if, you, if, you, if you're going to slide as a team on both sides of the ruck, that's that guy's job sometimes to pick up any loose traffic. So if, if Harry Johnson Holmes isn't just there, being in that lazy, yes, offside, yes, against the law position, sometimes that player on the far side of the ruck can get across and make a saving tackle. And the great motion, as I mentioned, of Ram and Abel and the nine around the corner is what keeps O'Connor outside the ball. It's what keeps Tate McDermott on the far edge of your screen interested. It's what gets uh, your winger out of the Reds' ruck, getting chasing back, and then you just see this massive hole. And the great thing about this is that if you can, if you can play it along, Benny, and we'll just admire it, it's not just Jack Maddox running a great line. It's It's... Dead set, 15 players at the Waratahs all doing their job. Uh, I think I mentioned on Twitter that it's something that Michael Checker and Chris Whitaker were doing at Leinster many years ago. Joe Smith and Leinster and I have done it a lot, very much. It's almost been known as their play. It's good to see Wits bringing that in. And I just love the execution, every single player doing their job. Jack Maddox, the try scorer, but an excellent team try, set play try, his play of the round. My man Lockie Swinton in there too, mate, throwing a nice pass. Yeah, good. You know, yeah, and that's the other thing. Sometimes it's the personnel too. Everyone's thinking, well, Lockie Swinton, he's just going to charge it forward. And then the second part of that is, oh, he might play the loop. No one's thinking about the lazy ball back inside. Maddox looked a bit like the great man Chris Latham slicing through there. Gee, he looks like a 15, Benny. <laughs> that's a lovely throw forward, mate, to the uh, the segment that you alluded to earlier. Um, this this is one that I think for, for regular listeners at our podcast, firstly, mate, good piece of analysis there. And if you haven't seen Morse go through things before, the way he unpicked that is great for the layman like me and, and perhaps you guys out there in that really understanding the way that nine runs the angle because, um, you know, that's the way a lot of players get set up. You'll see that nine do that loop a lot, but that was really another nice piece of deception there amongst two or three, which which made such a big hole. Um, but if you've listened to Morgs and I on the podcast before, Morgs has been quite strident uh, around Jack Maddox. Now, Maddox, of course, was down at the Rebels, uh, left there to move back to Sydney, though the up subtext of that, though, was, I don't think he was particularly happy down there. Morgs, um, one of the key points you wanted to make out of, out of the weekend was this. Yeah, it is. I mean, we've been saying it for a long time, Benny. We've said it in this show, said it on the podcast. Jack Maddox is a fullback, an excellent fullback, and he's going to be for a long time. People have talked about him being a 10 because he's a skillful player. He can actually throw a ball on both sides quite well. We saw a left foot, a decent left foot kick from him on the weekend. So he's he can kick off both feet when he has to. And, and it's great to see players with the confidence and the work ethic to have that confidence as well that goes behind it, to kick off both feet. It's what we want from our fullbacks. It's what we ideally want from our wingers. And it's definitely what we want from our 10s. So you see a talented footballer with good vision, Good skills, or we think, oh, maybe we should make him a 10. Perhaps it's what we did with Larkham all those years ago. We we're always looking to, to turn a player into the next great 10. This bloke's a fullback. He definitely isn't a winger. 
He's not brilliant positionally as a winger. Defensively, doesn't suit him as a winger. He'll he'll come up and make a really good front on tackle one on one if he has to as a fullback. But he was always out of position, just giving too much space to, to quality attackers at wing. It made him look worse than he was. He was unhappy on the wing. He's a fifteen. You, know, you understand the rebels. They got Hale Petty. You understand the early days with Beal. You know he was hesitant probably to come back to the Tars at the time. He was coming back to the Tars. Falau was still probably going to be there, and and, and Beal as well was going to be there. So now the Red Sea's open, and he has an opportunity. That he was he's solid coming through all the way through as a player once he played that, that 20s tournament. He's a fullback. Now what he's going to get, Benny, is an opportunity to create that body of work for Dave Rennie to watch. He's going to wear that 15 jersey. And if he continues on the way he is from the weekend, then he'll be in that well of his team. And the other him. thing is, the quick one is too, he's off contract at the end of the year. He should be one of the great priorities for the Tars and the Wallabies to lock in. Yeah. Mate, I love that. The body of work, another of your phrases, mate, you like to see players build a body of work. We will be calling our player of the round each round, but what you'll want to see is that consistency. You'll want to see those guys working ahead. And, of course, don't forget you can buy your body of work T-shirt at therugbyruckus.com. <laughs> mate, uh, let's close it out. Uh, this is the question that we have to ask. There's a lot of Sea of Blue fans out there who are, who are steaming and ready for this team to come back. Are the force going to get flogged? Now, my initial position when they were named coming back in, having seen some global rapid rugby, was I thought, uh-oh, this team is going to get flogged. The global rapid rugby, I really enjoyed it, looking at some of the different types of rules they brought in. Um, you know, fantastic the way that that state has kept itself alive. But the standard was not quite what you'd expect from a super team. And I thought, this is a great, great thing to see them back. But I was significantly concerned that they were going to get flogged. I've started to feel a little bit better. I've seen the names coming back. We had John O'Lance on our podcast uh, previously. Ollie Atkins, Peck Cowan, Nick Frisby, Palmer Fow, Ian Pryor. There's some good players there, Morgs. Morgs should force fans be concerned. Are they up to it? No, they shouldn't be concerned. And I think it's as much as the fact that there's no real standout to sort of one or two teams in this Super Rugby AU that's going to put them to the sword. You know, the, the Waratahs will be a young, they'll, they'll have a crack, they'll be inconsistent game to game and during games. They'll give away opportunities, but there's a lot of hope there for Waratahs fans at the moment, which probably wasn't there a few months ago. I think they should be hopeful. The Reds will be similar. The Reds are much more comfortable without the ball. They're probably not going to put 40 points on 10 because they're much more comfortable without the ball. They'll, they'll win some tight games. Uh, and they've got good young forward back coming through. The Brumbies, if they decide to turn it on, they beat the Rebels, truthfully. They beat the Rebels in second gear on the weekend. They went to sleep for five minutes. Rebels went bang, bang. But they always had that game under control. If they decide to turn it on, that could be one that gets ugly. So I can't see there being that much of a difference between the Force and the Super Rugby teams. My thoughts initially were I almost hoped that they do because we want Super Rugby to be a huge step up. We want it to be hard. We want it to be much better than Global Rugby Rugby. We want it to be a significant step up from NRC. The NRC champions shouldn't be able to step up straight to Super Rugby and compete. I got a sneaky suspicion they will. Bit of emotion. Yes, they brought some talent in. Quite settled preparation with a core group of players in Perth. I think Force fans should be hopeful and happy to be part of it. Mate, I think I think what will be important. I absolutely think they will be competitive. It's a matter of how long they're going to need to maintain it, and then they're going to need, you know injuries could be a problem for them. So they're going to need to try and roll through the season. But uh, it's good to see some some players in there that I think they can, can give them a good fist at it. And we saw John O'Lance again on our podcast a little while back. Uh, he talking about he wants a Wallabies jersey. So there's some guys in there who are really there to play, of course. Look, that, that concludes the topics that we wanted to cover today. Um, just throwing ahead, of course, next week, Rebels, Reds, Waratahs, Force, the Force getting their start. Crusaders, Blues is going to be huge. Hurricanes, Highlanders. We'll be back again next week. But before we go out today, Morgs, there's been a couple of questions from the punters. Don't forget, po post them onto YouTube and Facebook, and we will get to them at the end of the show, if not during, uh, depending how well I can drive things. Um, Morgs, first up, uh, Felix Roth asks about the Eight Nations Rugby Festival in place for the Autumn Internationals. Thoughts? Uh, is this the one with uh, who's, who's supposed to be going in? Mate, I think that's where Japan is heading up Japan. north with Fiji uh, to play with the Northern Hemisphere guys. Yeah, is that locked in or is it – because I saw the, the – I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think it's great. I think more opportunity for those players, you know, those teams, you know, call them tier, whatever you want, but I think both of those teams have earned opportunities, more opportunities – Probably more logical for them to be playing us, but we've got a few things to worry about in our backyard. Long term, I think Super Rugby is going to be Trans Tasman plus Japan. Uh, I think if Fiji end up part of it as well, that's great because everywhere you go, the Fijians will come and support them, so they'll be watched. So I think that's a great opportunity taken 
by the Six Nations nations, and, and there's a bit of self-interest there. The money of Japan, the entertainment factor of Fiji, why not try things? Great opportunity, great idea, good on them. Mate, absolutely. And, and I, I've seen a couple of stories saying that the global alignment might not be where it was, so we've got to keep an eye on that. We want to see what happens out there. Morgs, Ian College has a question for you. One area you'd like to see improved across all Australian teams. We're one round in. We've seen four of them play. Anything stand out? Yeah, I think multi-phase attack, which will always be the last thing. It's the as I said, we're excited rugby's back, and I reckon we'll give everyone a pass this week. Uh, but you know, a few teams were really comfortable without the ball, much more comfortable than with it. Uh, and some of the, we saw some of those set piece plays that they've been practicing. You see that Warrantas try; they would have practiced that a significant amount of times. It's exactly what you practice at training. The line out between the forty and the twenty-two is a lot of attacks come from. What I want to see is multi-phase playing what's in front, high skill, putting defences un under fatigue, being able to recycle possession but also move the ball. So if we can see chains of eight, nine, ten significant ground-making phase play, I'm not saying just hold the ball and recycle for no reason. We've also talked about zero to two phases, best opportunities with the ball, keep pace on the ball, make point breaks down and score. But if we're good enough, we should be able to pass the ball down the field, create opportunities in multi-phases. That's a sign that Australian rugby is on the improve. And I think one of the key points you made there, mate, was that it was only round one. They haven't played for some time. You know, they're getting their, their game back together. Can Australian Super Rugby teams face NZ uh, Rugby teams, says Blackie Boy, with some interesting uh, accents on the language, on the on the name in there. Um, look, it's probably uh, on the face of round one, you'd have to say clearly the better rugby was being played in New Zealand. That first half of the Brumbies-Rebels game was, was quite a forgettable half for me. I found that, you know, I was waiting for the game to get moving. We saw it a bit better. Saw a couple of good things, but really what you want to see is you want to see the Brumbies finding that form they had at the start of the year. You want to see the Rebels starting to find something. Now, a concern for me is that the Rebels, to me, need to be showing more. Dave Vessels has had plenty of opportunities with that team. And that team that came out against the Brumbies, they seemed a little tactically bereft to me. I wasn't quite sure what their intent was. Dave Wessels is being talked about in parts of the media as one of the game's best thinkers. We aren't seeing it with this Rebel side. So I, the Rebel side has the talent. The Brumbies side we know can do it. The Waratahs were better than I thought they would be. I was quite pleased with them. I thought they might get a bit of a, a touch-up from the Reds. But the, the Reds and the Waratahs, it was a, was, a, was a game which was well worth watching and you could see them going places. Morgs, what do you think about my call on the Rebels we need to see more from them, surely. Yeah, I suppose it's a backup to answer that question. I think the difference between the Australian New Zealand sides are probably similar to the start of the year, a little bit better than last year. The can is, well, they won't be playing because of all the restrictions. Look, the, the, the really harsh, cold, hard fact around the Rebels is I just think Dave Vessels is not the answer. That is, that, is, that is all the information we're seeing. They had two great opportunities, two years, and they didn't do it. They just didn't have the... the, the the environment there, the output, the tactical mouse, the technical capabilities to perform, and I don't see any evidence that that will change. That they're doing some, they're doing some pretty basic things in attack. Nothing. I haven't seen development in their game. That they're full of talented, hardworking, excellent rugby players, which is why when the Brumbies take their foot off the gas, they go bang bang. But I don't see anything building there. I don't see a particular amount of hope. You know, that, truthfully, the Rebels need three to five years to be left alone and develop. The problem is they burnt their first decade and they'll never get three to five years of patience in Australian rugby to build something, whether it's locally homegrown talent coming through. You look at Hunter Paisan, he goes off to the Reds and absolutely kills it. Maddox mm -hmm. goes elsewhere, absolutely kills it. Those are worrying signs. Paisami, for example, locally homegrown product, Rebels had him. Couldn't do it enough with him. Couldn't develop him. Young players there that haven't kicked on. I haven't seen who, who have you seen improve Benny as a player in the last few years? There, mate. That's that's an excellent call. No one springs to mind, and I think there's a couple of guys that that you know you saw some talent in that we hoped would get a bit more of a crack, like a Matt Phillip, for instance, that probably haven't been able to take that next step that you would that would see them get you know that 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 wallaby, I suppose, look in. Yeah, that that become a rolling door, a revolving door for talent. Um, I think the harsh truth is they'll probably need a new head coach uh, and, and start to rebuild again on the back of some some excellent young Victorian talent they need to identify, keep together and play games of footy with. That's it. Now, Morgs, look, I think, I think that's going to wrap us up for the night. We'll just get one more comment from John Barkley from, who's from the WTF uh, with the Australian Rugby Facebook group. He wants to know how you keep that 5 o'clock shadow going, pal. Oh, it's actually laziness, not wanting to, to shave every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, know, I, I might do a clean. I can go clean shave next next week if you want, or I can just leave it grow for a while. So 
Thanks, mate. Well, we'll bated so breath, bated so. breath on my end, mate. Can't wait to see what you come yeah. up with. But look, the, the that, was, <laughs> that was the Rugby Ruckus Tight Five. Uh, Morgs, uh, as we started the show, let's end the show. Fantastic to see an Australian rugby back. Um, you know, really enjoyed seeing the players run around. Um, there's a few things that we want to get into probably next week. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about too. I've seen plenty of punters aren't happy with Phil Kearns on the Fox Sports coverage, and I think a couple of guys asked us to talk about that. Let's talk about that next week because I know I've got views on that. Um, but but really, what a what a, an excellent thing that our game is back out there and that we can see a lot of good young players. We can see a lot of good things coming yeah. that I think we want to see build. And uh, you know what we've got to get? We've got Dave Rennie on the show, I think, Morgs. How's that for a last thought? Yeah, well, you've probably got him on speed dial, don't you? You're, you're pretty right. good, you? Can get he's him ringing in. me. Who are your top players for the week, Ben? Yeah, he's, oh, you're the fourth selector. You're, you're <laughs> yeah, the fourth selector, it. yeah. <laughs> um, no, mate, as you said, and as we said at the top of the show, congrats to the Reds. Congrats to the Brumbies. Two wins to start it off. Mate, welcome back to the force. Good luck to the force this week. Great to see you back. Can't wait for a round two of Super Rugby AU. That's it, mate. And I'll be watching that Crusaders Blues game as well. That yeah. was the Rugby Ruckers Type 5, 8 o'clock Sundays. Put your comments and questions in as we go, and we'll do it again next week.